The following podcast is taken from a live broadcast on Inspire FM. Assalamu alaikum and welcome to the Book Club Show on Inspire 105.1 FM. My name is Imrana and I am your host this morning. Um, I'm actually really excited. So I'm not in the actual studio. Um, I'm in my, I guess, home studio for now. Um, and obviously it's kind of been um, happening a little bit like that since um, we were um, in lockdown. Um, but I am excited that we do have a Facebook Live today because I do have um, a special guest that will be joining us. Um, and the book that we are going to be discussing today is called Finding Mr. Perfectly fine um so it is a debut book by this name of the rashid um so what i'll do is i'm just going to give a, a bit of a quick introduction um or just read the blurb give you an idea of what the book is about and then hopefully this will be joining us shortly as well inshallah um so if you are on facebook live you can see it is a beautiful um a color um it's um yellow and you can see there is a man and a woman um who are kind of staring at each other maybe the, the the ladies looking maybe a little bit um perplexed um so what it does say is when the pressure's on to find someone does it matter if he's not the one um so the blurb is last week i turned 29 along with the usual homemade victoria sponge helium balloon and selfridges gift vouchers my mum's birthday present to me was the threat that if i'm not engaged by my 30th birthday she's sending me off to the motherland to find a fresh from the dish husband when zara's mum puts together the most archaic of arrangements marriage resources, not exactly the rom-com worthy love story she had envisioned for herself, Zara is soon exhausted by her family's failed attempts to set her up with every vaguely suitable Abdul, Ahmed and Farouk. So she decides to take matters into her own hands by signing up for marriage apps and speed dating. After all, how hard can it be to find a husband? When she meets Hamza, a kind British Egyptian who shares her values, Zara knows he would make a good husband. While she's aware that not all marriages are based on love or lust, at first sight, Zara struggles with a lack of spark, particularly when she can't stop thinking of someone else. So as her 30th looms and family pressures um, intensifies, Zara knows she must make a decision, but will she make the right one? So that is the really super intriguing uh, blurb for um, the book Finding Mr. Perfectly Fine, which has been written by Tasneem Abdul-Rashid, who is joining us in the studio. I am going to give you a quick introduction to... Um, Tasneem because obviously I'm so excited to be having her um, yeah just join us um, in the show but before um, we do that if you do want to contact please uh, feel free to contact obviously um, Inspire FM Studio if you have any questions today it would be really really lovely um, yeah it'd be really really lovely to hear from you um, and so I'm just going to say assalamu alaikum to um, Tasneem. Walaikum salam thank you so much for having me today. Thank you so much for taking the time I, um, to join us. I'm really, really excited that um, I've got the opportunity to talk to you about this wonderful, wonderful book. Um, I guess where I'd really like to start is um, just what was your inspiration to become a writer, I think, first and foremost? Because I know that our listeners tend to really like to hear about people's kind of journey to, to becoming writers and authors. Sure. I mean, I think I've always known I was going to write a book. I've always known I was going to get to this point, alhamdulillah. I've been writing stories ever since I was, you know, a child. Um, when I was about, what, seven, eight years old, my dad bought me my first computer. And that mm -hmm. was back in the days when no one had computers at home. And he bought that for me and he said, look, this is for you to write stories on. And um, so everyone knew that I wanted to get to this point. So alhamdulillah. I'm 39 now, so it's taken a long time. Mm -hmm. um, but I got there in the end. That's amazing. No, it's so, and I think, you know, I really love that um, kind of conviction because um, I think it is about having big and beautiful intentions, right? And, and no matter how, you know, we don't need to necessarily put a time frame. I think sometimes it's, you know, we, we talk about pressures and, and especially as women, and I know we're going to um, come on to that um, a little bit in a moment as well. Um, so just to read um, a bit of your bio, just so um, our listeners uh, have a bit more uh, background, I guess, um, to you. So you're a British Bengali, uh, Bengali writer, uh, born and raised in London, a mother of two. Um, so you've walked uh, across media, PR and communications, both, both in the UK and the UAE. Um, so today you're spending your time writing novels and nights co-hosting the award-winning podcast, Not Another Mum Pod. And in between, um, you're busy trying and often failing to be a super mum, super wife and super chef. 
Um, so you recently completed a master's in creative writing with distinction. And this is obviously your um, debut rom-com, which is Finding Mr. Perfectly Fine, uh, which has been um, published by, is it pronounced Zafre? I say Zafar. But I have no so, idea if that's how you're supposed okay. to say it. I've been saying that. I'm going to apologise in advance if that's kind of, I, I'm pronouncing it. I should bit. check actually. <laughs> yeah, actually, that, I, I know, maybe should have done that sooner. But thank you again. Um, so, okay, so we've, we've heard a little bit about what got you into um, writing and kind of what your intentions were. But what specifically about, was your plan always to write like a rom type? No, not at all. So, yeah, like I didn't know what I wanted to write. So with this book, um, Ever since my friends and I reached that age where everyone starts looking for a husband for you, right? And we're talking about when we were teenagers, we were 18, 19 years old when our parents started talking, having the conversation and saying, you know, we better start looking. It could take years. We don't want to wait until their degrees are finished because, you know, what if it takes another 10 years from there? We need to get the ball rolling. Um, so this conversation has been going on since we were, in, since we were teenagers, basically, amongst my friends and I. Mm. And um, when I saw the kind of things that they were going through, even more so than I was going through, mm. I just thought to myself, you know what, this is a story that needs to be written down. Yeah. But at that point, um, I was still young. I hadn't like, I don't think I had that kind of determination at that point to start um, this mm. long process of trying to get the story down. So I was collecting stories. I've basically been collecting stories mentally, sometimes writing them down mm. over the years. Every time something interesting would happen to somebody, I'd make yeah. a note of it and think, okay, you know what, I'm going to I'm gonna write that. I'm going to use that one day. So I, was, I think I've been collecting these stories along the, across the mm. years. Mm. And what happened was um, when I had my second child, so I've been, so I fell into my career. I started working in comms and alhamdulillah, it was really good. I moved to Dubai. Um, I worked for magazines there. I worked for communications, PR. I did everything. I lived there for about seven years mm -hmm. and um, had writing a book kind of got shelved a little bit. And then when I came back to the UK, um, I had my first child, I had my second child and I was on maternity leave. Um, at that moment, I was working in comms as well. I was on maternity leave and I just felt so lonely and I was so bored and I just didn't know what my life was beyond parenting. Mm. And yeah, I love being a mom, absolutely love it, but it's really, really tough. And especially mm. when, you know, when your whole life kind of changes overnight, you start thinking sometimes, you know, what is your purpose beyond this? Um, mm. Because you spend the whole day talking to little babies. My husband was at work all day. So days, hours would go by without mm. me speaking to an adult. And it's that endless, thankless mm. cycle, right? of just cleaning, mm. cooking, laundry, changing, nappies, wiping bums, and repeat <laughs> over and over, right? So when my baby yeah. was six months old, I was awake for the 10th time that night. It was three o'clock mm. in the morning. And I was like, I can't do this. I need something else. I need mm. something else, right? So then mm. I just took out my laptop and I was feeding him. I reached over his body and I was like, I'm going to write that story that I've been wanting to write all these mm. years. And yeah. that's kind of how I did it. And it was my escape. It was my way to get away from the mundane acts of like mm. every day servitude right mm -hmm. and then I thought and it gave me something else it gave me like a purpose beyond parenting and mm -hmm. it just made me feel like myself again because I think yeah. you can sometimes feel a bit lost you forget who you are and who yeah. you were before you became a mom um, mm -hmm. so yeah it kind of made me feel like myself so I started writing these chapters I didn't plan anything I just yeah. knew I wanted a character I wanted her to be Bengali I wanted her to be from North London yeah. right and that's all I knew and I just started mm -hmm. writing and what I did at that point was upload chapters to a blog. Right. I wrote chapters, I put it on a blog. Then I'm part of this online Facebook group called Muslim Mamas. And mm. I would share chapters um, on that, on their book club page. And I'd be like, this is this thing I'm writing. Let me know what you think. And then everyone started reading it and everyone really enjoyed it. And they were like, oh, my God, we've never read a story like this about a British Bengali girl looking for a mm. husband. Like, that was so... Like revolutionary at that time yeah. um, and they were proper like egging me on <laughs> and giving me the courage yeah, to yeah, yeah, yeah. and I think sometimes we start projects and then it kind of just disappears when that initial fervor wears off yeah. but because I had people reading it and now I had an audience and now I had to commit to them right yeah. and I couldn't let them down so now I had to carry on writing this story mm. um, and it just kind of happened without me planning much um, yeah, yeah. which was also by the way not a great idea by the way because what happened <laughs> okay. I planned it it became this massive book so when I tr finished it off it was just huge because it had plots and subplots and characters like all over the place yeah because I hadn't put it through and then I had to like yeah. stop and then strip the whole thing back again when I went through the process yeah. of giving publication and all of that mm -hmm. so yeah I want to recommend you do that I think plan <laughs> 
fair enough. Fair enough. No, 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 that's a valid point. But but no, it's so amazing to, I mean, you've touched on so many kind of important things there because, yeah, there's primarily that thing and, and you know, you talk about in, in, you know, your book as well, the expectations on women, I guess, and this idea yeah. that, you know, you, you mentioned kind of servitude and, and, and motherhood and all the things that are expected of us. But actually, obviously, of course, there's always a, a life outside of that and before that. And then, you know, what, what you want to kind of do with it. And, you know, yeah. I think, you know, it's so interesting. And definitely you get that, um, not just through Zara, who's obviously the main character in your book, but obviously like her sisters and her kind of friends. And, you know, it's there's a lot um, that you kind of talk about. And it, I think it's, and I think actually it's amazing having heard the way that you've kind of come about actually putting it into a book. Um, there are so many points. I mean, I just look, I've got, I've got like little <laughs> things like for, for making notes. I was like, oh my God, this is, you know, the, there's so many snippets, I guess, that you can really, really kind of think more deeply about as well. Um, so maybe just, just kind of on that, you know, so you, from the outset of this book, you're kind of tackling that negative way that women do get treated when they start to become, you know, older I don't you know and, and I, I say older but actually you're still very young and you start having you know yeah. these labels put on you um so do you think that Muslim women at the moment are maybe you know um challenging that in a, in a way which is kind of having an impact I guess 100 percent 100 percent I mean when I look at how it was when we were younger yeah. um it's completely different now so mm. um I mean my sister my older sister got married when she was 20 right mm. and that would never mm. happen now that's something that mm. would that's like a complete rarity to happen now at that time mm. when we were growing up i remember we had this cousin and everyone was worried about her everyone thought she's never mm. going to get married she's so old she's focused so much on her career and what's mm. she going to do and now we were talking about it recently actually because we were young then i was about 16 when this was going on and we thought oh my god she's yeah. so old like that's right. happening right yeah she was 28 right she was 28 <laughs> <laughs> And now looking back, I'm thinking, oh my God, she was so young and she had this mm. immense pressure on her mm. and um, everyone telling her that she was too fussy and all of that just because, what, she, what did she wait for? She was only 28. Yeah. You know, she did a degree, she did her, her LPC, she did her master's, mm. you know, she, like, she was establishing her career at that point and she was still really young. But, mm. but now, so now I've got so many cousins who are 27, 28 mm -hmm. and it's not considered old at this point. It's yeah. considered, okay, you need to start thinking and you need to... Yeah along a little bit but no way have you you know is your biological clock about to yeah. you know run out at that yeah, point yeah, yeah. So i think mm -hmm. definitely the narrative and the expectations mm -hmm. are beginning to change and muslim women are definitely um mm -hmm. challenging that and putting yeah. their um their own selves and careers and everything before um mm -hmm. looking for someone yeah 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 and you know and i guess that's the thing isn't it because there is still that kind of notion that oh but if a woman's career minded that's somehow a negative thing or or, or if there's too much focus on you know what i don't know it could be traveling or, or having some sort of life experience but actually i think you know people tend to forget that it's you know, you, if you are going to, I mean, not again, not all women, you know, end up becoming mothers, but I guess it's just about having that um, kind of holistic approach to life, right? And you, you're not necessarily going to be able to live it unless you've, you know, experienced stuff. So I don't know. I think there's definitely, you know, a, a valid point. And I agree. I mean, you know, women are definitely marrying a bit later now. Um, and that obviously isn't, isn't necessarily a, a negative thing at all. Um, so I think there's another bit in um, the book, which I thought, Again, it was kind of interesting, maybe in a slightly different point. So um, Zara, who's the character, sort of, she's at a wedding and then um, you kind of describe the bidai. And um, I know that if um, from Pakistani heritage, you might say that like, um, mm -hmm. And again, you know, it kind of made me laugh at one point because this idea that if as a bride, you're caught smiling or <laughs> you're not like crying your eyes out, there's something like, you know, the rumours will spread or they're going to think there's something dodgy going on. And you think it's actually meant to be the happiest day of your life potentially because of you getting married so again you know the way that the narrative is around like women and, and marriage and how they should behave i guess i was just really thinking about what your thoughts kind of were about that really and and, and what yeah. you're hoping by tackling that kind of thing in the book that readers are going to take from it yeah i think i think the reason why i put it into the book was mm. because i think it's something so my i'm hoping that this book is going to be read by people from our community and beyond our community as well because mm. i feel like it's a story that transcends um culture the story of looking for somebody whether you're man woman you know um 
gay or straight even yeah. you know looking for somebody it transcends culture right yeah. um and i think um when i put that scene in there i kind of wanted to highlight this thing that other cultures or other communities might not go through like like mm -hmm. you said the, the wedding is supposed to be the happiest mm -hmm. day of your life but whereas in our culture in the bengali culture especially we have this mm -hmm. really emotional moment when you're crying mm -hmm. when you leave um and it's not necessarily because you're unhappy it's because mm -hmm you're upset that you're going to be leaving your family and your life's about to change completely and often mm -hmm. you don't really know what you're getting into you might know the person you're marrying but you don't know what his family is going to be like and as we know we us Bengalis um, and Asians in particular mm -hmm. we marry our in-laws not just um, our partners right so it's that whole unknown of not yeah. knowing what lies beyond um, that mm -hmm. person that you're spending the rest of your life with and I think I just wanted to highlight that because mm -hmm. I think it's quite a special part of our weddings as well yeah. Um, and I, yeah, and I just wanted to highlight that to show that, you know what, it, it can be bittersweet. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I think you've done that really well. You've captured it. I mean, I remember, it, 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 because I think it does allow that, you know, there's a moment coming which allows you to have a really... Um, intimate I guess it's really with your parents and your siblings you know before you leave and of course there is that nature of, of leaving um but yeah but I guess yeah at, at the same time it's it's the it's the um perception of you know thinking you know again in you know or do people might say, you know, log again, get that. What are people going to think? Like, if you're, yeah. I mean, I remember, <laughs> I'm sure she won't mind um, mentioning, but a friend of mine, when she got married, in the run up to getting married, she was, no way am I going to um, cry or be upset. And, and I was like, no, you're about to. And she wasn't. She was on the wedding. You know, she was like on the horse and carriage, kind of being carted away. Yeah. And, that's, and I thought, God, that's actually really beautiful. But yeah, I was thinking, I wonder, well. what, I wonder what everyone's thinking. Yeah, like I've had a friend who um, got married and then beforehand she was like, you know what, I'm really worried. Like, what if I don't cry? Because you've got to cry on demand, right? You don't know how you're going to feel in that moment. Okay, so right, no. and I don't know if this happened in it happens in the Pakistani culture, but in the Bengali culture, up until recently, um, during the nikah, there'd be a lot of tears just before you right. say kabul, right? Yeah, so yeah. people would cry their eyes out, and then the imam mm. would have to coax them into agreeing and be like, "Is that a yes? Are you saying yeah. yes?" And then the bride would be crying and crying and unable yeah. to say it, even right. if she's chosen to marry that person. You know, it would be yeah, like that. Absolutely. And um, so, but yeah, I think things are definitely changing. I don't think it's yeah. as dramatic and emotional yeah. maybe as it was before and I think that is to do with expectations on women but also to do with the fact that I guess there are less arranged marriages than there were before so mm -hmm. people a lot more marriages now people mm -hmm. know that they're marrying quite closely and really well yeah, so yeah, yeah. as emotional as if you're marrying someone who's a semi-stranger mm, no no absolutely and, and actually that takes us really nice into the next question I had um so again, in, in finding Mr. Perfect, you find you you mention obviously the fact that the, the process of arranged marriages and this idea of the bio data, which is basically in essence like a CV that you swap yeah. with each other, and and um, and I think what, but there was one point that you do mention in there about the reason our like parents' generation do that thing where you know looking for. Um, somebody from the same kind of village in, in Pakistan or Bangladesh or you know or it could be um, the same caste so to speak and even Islamically obviously it's not something that you know it's it's a it, we don't believe that but obviously culturally it exists mm -hmm. but I think what it really made me wonder is do you think that there's any part of us as the newer generation or even younger than us I guess who, who are now looking for marriage or to get married do we need to have do you think a bit more trust it's still in that system because obviously there is some sort of um logic to it i guess or? I think, yeah i think there is some logic and some wisdom to some of it mm -hmm. i think some of our um parents and older generations might take it a bit too far and consider only that when as opposed to looking at it as a package mm. but I think that in an arranged marriage scenario when you know very little about the person and especially in that initial stage when you see their bio data right mm -hmm. so you're basing everything or like whether or not to meet that person based on what's written on that piece of paper and I think that there are so many challenges in a marriage anyway um, it's, it can help to have somebody of a similar upbringing or a similar background to you because you kind of know what you're getting in for. Your families would be on a similar wavelength yeah, and yeah. you probably have more commonalities. And mm -hmm. that aspect of it will just be that little bit easier, I think, when you're navigating marriage. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that's, that's all I'll say. I think that's the, at the most. I think you can't obviously say that mm -hmm. every marriage 
diff- people from different cultures is going to be failure. Not at all. Yeah. I'm not even married to a Bengali myself, you know. Yes. Yeah. So um, again, mm-hmm. of course, it can work out, but it brings a new set of challenges. So as well as dealing with a person and a husband mm-hmm. and a spouse and all of their ways and having to learn how to live with somebody and mm-hmm. parenthood and all of that, then you've got mm-hmm. the additional challenge of navigating a, a culture that you don't know about and all those mm-hmm. different nuances. So I think it, I think it can help, but I don't think it's the be all and end all. And of course, you can marry somebody who's your cousin, who's mm-hmm. in the exact same background and that could fall mm-hmm. to pieces, you know? I think there's just so many ingredients that go into mm-hmm. your successful marriage and it's just yeah. one thing as well yeah yeah yeah, absolutely and that's the kind of crucial aspect isn't it like you said that it shouldn't just be the be all and end all that that, that's the only kind of framework to to kind of use and i think that's when obviously it becomes uh, a bit of a problem when when it comes to marriage and um but yeah, no, and I think it's really interesting. And again, you do this um, in some places in the book. You do it explicitly. At the times, it's quite subtle. But actually, the it's almost that sense the grueling kind of process of even going through an arranged marriage. I know there's this kind of tendency that oh, but you know, because you're not dating, maybe there's a kind of potentially less heartbreak or whatever it might be. But at the same time, this idea of of being put on display and you know mm-hmm. having to each time get you know family to see you know there's there's a lot of sense you managed to capture that yeah, and i think um, yeah, it's often like, a, like yeah. looking for a job you know when you go through that process of applying for a job and getting rejected yeah. over and over go through interviews yeah, yeah. and phone time and um, i think yeah it, it can feel yeah. like that can not it yeah yeah absolutely and i think yeah and i think that's really i think i don't think we talk about that enough especially when it comes to you know our parents generation or even you know our generation might eventually at some point now start looking for for their kids as well and actually we we need to maybe create that safe space where our children can come to us and look actually this is really not nice or or whatever it might be so you know there's definitely um i think yeah further conversation you know to be had there um so i, I think we've got about two three minutes uh, or just maybe a little bit over before we go to the break um but just before that i thought it would be really um great to get an idea of the fact that um well, i'm trying to think whether we've got enough time to, to talk about this but yeah just maybe very quickly so there was a point in the story that um the i think zara's with her sister and and they're going somewhere on they're on the train track right Mm -hmm. and then there's you kind of just mentioned it's something i think just and i actually remember reading an article i think on um amalia about it but the idea that you don't want to stand too close to kind of the platform edge and you know the whole notion of i think islamophobia and and the fears that we have as as visible muslim women specifically i guess um so why did you kind of put put that into the story or was there Um, yeah because it's it's something i go through i'm a londoner so i you know Mm. there was a point when i was on the true platform every single day and Mm. when it was a crowded platform i was petrified of standing too close to the yellow line because Mm. i was scared especially after 9 11 and 7 7 and everything i was scared Mm. someone was going to push me in and Mm. i think i mentioned that in the book because zara and her sister don't wear hijab so Mm. they've never had to feel that before and um, because her sister wears a hijab on that instance it's mm-hmm. the first time they've been in that they've had that experience and and so they felt that and it was something you know unknown to them previously and i think it's something that only if you're a visible muslim you would understand and obviously yeah. not everybody would feel like that but me personally i do feel like that so i wanted to get that across as well mm-hmm. in, in the book. i think well what i do with the book is i try and put in lots of little little different issues that we go through as Muslim women but in a a light-hearted way and I think that's yeah that was definitely one of them yeah and I think you've and and again you know you've done that so you've just um intertwined those in a really yeah it just really works and I think that's what makes the book so relatable I mean I was reading thinking oh yeah you know I I know how that feels I had somebody who knew it who got really offended by that Oh, yeah. So I think she wears hijab and she was like, how dare she? Like, what? What we feel like we're going to get attacked. Just, and I was thinking, okay, but you know, everyone's experience is different. You know what I mean? Yeah, completely. And it was really interesting to see that because obviously it means not everyone in hijab feels like that. Mm, Everyone feels like a target, which is amazing to feel like that. That's the dream, isn't it? Not to feel like that. Yeah, 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 exactly. And and again, you know, there's a kind of wider question of as, um, a Muslim writer, um, you know, sometimes I guess our communities have expectations and any Muslim creatives that you need to represent 
all of us. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we'll write an article about that one day because it is yeah. such a huge burden to carry and yeah. it's so hard. And no matter what you do, there's going to be someone out there who gets offended by what you've done. Yeah, 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 exactly. yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'm, I mean, and on that note, I think we've just got about a minute or so left. Like, what, how are you kind of cope, not coping is the right word. Um, I mean, the book's out there, it's out in the world. And so, yeah. like, how does that feel? I'm finding it hard. Like, I love it because most of it, like 99%, I would say, of the of the feedback has been absolutely amazing. And I've had people from all walks of life um, DMing me um, and mm-hmm. telling me how much they've enjoyed it, how much they can relate to it, how important it is for us to have our stories out there, how seen they felt as mm-hmm. a Bengali really celebrity for the first time to see themselves in literature. And that's mm-hmm. just amazing. And I live for that, you know? Mm-hmm. And there have been a couple of criticisms by Muslims yeah. um, on like things about Islam and especially about hijab. And yeah. um, at first it hurt because I'm a hijabi and I'm a visible Muslim. I've been wearing hijab since I was 10 years old, you know. Mm-hmm. And the last thing I would have wanted to do is to upset somebody in hijab, yeah. you know. Um, but I've, at the end of the day, we're so diverse. We're yeah. so diverse as a religion, as a community and as a culture mm-hmm. even. And you're never yeah. going to be able to represent somebody else's experience. And you shouldn't have to do that. I yeah. think we need to get to a point where we don't feel the need to represent everybody. Yeah, exactly. And that's such a perfect point, I think, just to kind of end the first half on. Um, so we are um, talking today about um, finding Mr. Perfectly Fine by the scene of the Rashid. Uh, but we are heading to the break. You can grab maybe um, a tea and biscuits and we will be back with you shortly. So assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. This is Atif Nawaz. Listen to Inspire FM shows in your time by heading over to inspirefm.org or listen on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. <laughs> Assalamu alaikum and welcome back to the book club show on Inspire 105.1 FM. My name is Imrana Mahmood and on today's show we do have our beautiful guest who is Tasneem Abdul Rashid and we are talking about her debut book Finding Mr. Perfectly Fine Um, and in the first half of the show we were talking about some of the kind of topics and themes that she um, mentions in the book. Uh, Now, the book itself, for those of you who've just joined us, is about a 29-year-old Bengali woman who has basically a year to find a husband because of all the pressures. Um, This idea of almost being... um, you know, uh, pass your sell by date. And we had a bit of conversation with um, this theme about those kind of pressures that women face when it comes to marriage, uh, the expectations, um, different kind of cultural norms, and um, I guess those kind of different thinking patterns when it comes to our parents' generation and ours. Um, but I'm really excited to... Um, Welcome to Sneem back and kind of continue talking about her beautiful book, Finding Mr. Perfectly Fine. Um, the next question I wanted to ask you to Sneem was that um, there's a mention, obviously, so she's going through, she takes matters into own hands because obviously her mum's um, going through the route of a traditional arranged marriage and having bio data and, and, and doing those things. Um, but she decides to try um, signing up to a marriage app and, you know, kind of online um, an online search. Um, so I really wanted to, to kind of delve into what that kind of world means, that when we make that decision as women uh, or men um, to kind of search for our partner online, I think we sometimes get a bit of neg- negative kind of thinking, like, oh, like, why are you doing that? Or, or, or even this kind of sign is, oh, you must be quite desperate. So there's, again, there's a bit of negativity. Um, so yeah, so what, what were your kind of thoughts about that? You know what, it's actually really interesting because um, when I first started writing the book, because I was writing it from my friends and my own experiences from when we were a lot younger, mm-hmm. there weren't Muslim dating apps then. And mm-hmm. I think um, there was only like shadi.com at that time and it was still quite new and not many people had been using it. If they did, they didn't admit it. Yeah, and I kind of left it out when I first started writing it. Then I was talking to one of my friends who is recently single, so she'd been married for 10 years, mm-hmm. recently became divorced, and now she's putting mm-hmm. herself back out there, right, to find right. someone. Yeah. And she said to me, Look, you need to include the whole app thing on here because this is how mm-hmm. everyone finds a partner now. So then I went and started talking to all my friends who are single. Right. now and, yes. and and we're looking for people and people who are younger than me and looking mm-hmm. um to get married and talk to them about how they were finding people and that everybody was like yeah we're on the apps like this is the yeah. only way and i think yeah. and i understand it completely because firstly mm-hmm. you can't just rely on your parents because they have a limited network right they just mm-hmm. know who they know and yeah. i think the apps open up a whole world of people beyond the network that your family mm-hmm. knows and yeah. especially if you want to marry somebody outside your culture or if you're open to marrying outside your culture, mm-hmm. um, then, yeah, 
then there's a whole world of people on those apps, right? Yeah. And, but everyone who I spoke to has mm. had a pretty traumatizing experience. There are a couple who have found their partners through the apps, mm. but they've had yeah. to go through this really soul destroying process mm. in order to get to that stage. Yeah. And, yeah. and I wanted to show what that was like because one thing, one recurring theme that kept coming up was guys, firstly, aren't always who they say they are. Mm. And I'm sure women as well. You know, I've, I've spoken to uh, male relatives who are on the apps and they're like, it's the women as well. They're not who they say they are. Sure. You know, they pretend they're X, Y, and Z. And then you come up yeah. to the meeting and there's someone completely different. Forget that. He's yeah. like, they all, they look different. He's like, the women yeah. look really different. <laughs> they're putting up pictures with filters that change the eye yeah. colour. That will change all their facial features. Um, yeah, but, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then yeah. you come up and you meet somebody and they're actually, they feel like they're being catfished too. But that's yeah. a story for another day. My story is yeah. about the CELO experience. Exactly, exactly. I might have yeah, to yeah. one one day, but I feel like a man yeah. should do that. But anyway, yeah, exactly. um, so yes, yeah, so I wanted to show that kind of how soul destroying it can be and how you have to wade through so many people before yeah. you find the right one. But obviously, because my books are a certain length, um, mm. I actually wrote like a really long book to begin with and I had a lot more of this in there and I had to strip it back a lot because it was just too long but there yeah. was so much more I wanted to show about all of that so I think that's going to have to be another book I think yeah yeah absolutely please write it but yeah no, I think I completely echo because um, again you know talking to friends who are younger than me who, who were single and having to go through that and, and I almost think you know myself who's gone kind of, who went through the traditional I guess arranged marriage route um, but then yeah I'm just comparing and, and I think they're both just as challenge, <laughs> challenging, yeah. it has its challenges. Yeah. And, and you know, um, I mean, you shouldn't, I, the idea isn't even to pick one against the other, is it? It's really about saying, look, that, you know, searching for your partner or for your spouse or any partner, it's it's such a big decision to make, you know, and, and, and obviously you want to make the right one. But yeah, and this idea of honesty, integrity. And again, you know, Zahra in your book, Finding Mr. Perfectly Fine, um, you know, at one point, because she's, she's quite tall, isn't she? I can't remember now. Yeah, five she's five foot eight. eight. So I'm five, five foot eight. eight. Yeah. Oh right, okay. And, and then I'm just getting really five eight. It's not like yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, I can already, I can already see, yeah, how that could have, you know. But again, it's um. So she at one point meets one of the um men that she'd been obviously talking to online, mm. and obviously it turns out he's much much shorter than he said, yeah. and didn't even seem like it was an issue. But yeah, it happens. I've heard it as well. Um, but no, I am glad that obviously that that is part of the book and and. Yeah, it's definitely something that, again, you know, needs to be needs to be talked about. But kind of on that um, kind of conversation we're having now about Muslim marriage apps and, and finding mm -hmm. a partner, um, I know recently, yeah, I mean, recently more so, some of the marriage apps have kind of come and I guess a little bit of criticism in terms of the way they're operating, um, the way they market themselves. So I'm kind of thinking, like, what, what needs do those app marriage apps or people running them need to do, provide a better service for, for, for you I know so. i think they need to do more to safeguard women because mm. based on the conversations that i've had um yeah. a lot of these people so i've mentioned it at the book right at the beginning mm. when zara's mm. on the startup and then her sister's like oh my friends are on it too and she's like what mm. you guys are like 21 mm. well why are you guys on the apps she's like we're not looking to get married they're not looking to get married they just want to date you know yeah. so i think what's happening is that people are using um the apps mm. as a dating site really they're not really interested in getting married at all mm. and what, uh, what i've realized through my research was that a lot of women come across mm. with married men for example yeah interesting yeah. um and they're pretending to be single and they're just out there having a good time Mm. Um, and there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of dodgy people as soon as they get your number they send you inappropriate messages pictures as soon as they say hello to you the next line could be something yes. you know mm. an innuendo or worse yeah. um, and that's what's happening to everyone across the board and I don't know what I don't know how they need to tackle that I don't know how yeah. they would tackle that I mean what kind of processes need to be in place I mean they've obviously got facial recognition technology to verify yeah. the person mm -hmm. in the picture is you right so that's yeah. great you can do that yeah. but there needs yeah. to be a way to kind of make sure that these people are maybe single or they're serious mm -hmm. i don't know how though that's the thing yeah, yeah, yeah because they provided this platform and they provided this service mm -hmm. they have a duty of care yeah. towards users, especially towards vulnerable users which is offered women and mm -hmm. yeah, um, yeah. sure. so i think they've done some good things because i think one of the apps now they allow you to make calls through the app which right. is great because now people don't have to give their numbers out um, to strangers if they want to have a conversation so they can talk through that immediately. 
And okay. also, I think there's a video calling feature now on the app um, mm-hmm. okay. because you can make sure the person you're talking to is the person that you're talking to. Exactly. Um, you're not being catfished. Massively. No. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think, right. yeah, which is, I think that's really good. But I think mm-hmm. yeah, it needs to be done to safeguard women. Yeah, absolutely. And it's such a, um, yeah, important because it's about accountability, like you said, if they've providing a service and safeguarding is such a massive thing. And it's, you know, even important, more important because of the technological advancement, I guess, in terms of meeting people. Um, But, you know, I I just didn't realise that what would be really good is just for listening, in case they don't know what the term catfishing means, could you just kind of um, explain that a little bit? Yeah, so catfishing is when you say you are someone online and you're not necessarily that. So you could be pretending that um, you could say that you look a certain way and you actually look like something else. You could pretend that you're from a certain background. You could pretend Mm -hmm. anything that's not the truth, basically, and you portray yourself as someone else online. That's Mm -hmm. catfishing. Yeah, there's a whole program on on, on MTV Mm -hmm. called Catfish. Oh, really? Oh, yeah, it's in the US. Have you ever watched it? No, no, I haven't. Well, you have to watch it. There's a US one and a UK one. And these people are going to be something. It could be a girl yeah. pretending yeah. to be a man and talking to yeah. this person online for two years and they think they're in love and then they never oh. want to meet up and make excuses and just cancel all the time. And it's because it's actually a woman. Wow. You know, so there's so many things happening. You've got to be so yeah. careful. If you're going to go on the apps, yeah. please be tech savvy and be aware of what's going on around you and just safeguard yeah. yourself as much as possible yeah 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 no thank you so much for saying that it's so important and um so yeah for our listeners we're, we're talking today to tasneem abdul rashid and we're talking about her debut book finding mr perfectly fine um and if you do yeah, if you do have any thoughts or questions please feel free to um contact the studio or we are on facebook live um so you can leave um comments and i'll, I'll do my best to, to kind of check if you do want to leave uh, a comment or a question for to um so obviously we've, okay we've talked a little bit about about marriage apps and and i think what was really you know i mentioned before how relatable i, I found the book and i think a huge part of the fact um that is you've written Zara as someone who's very deeply connected to her faith. So yes, okay, you know, she you mentioned that she doesn't wear hijab, but actually you navigate and, and tackle um, that in a really kind of um, delicate way as well, which I thought was really great. Um, but I guess my, my question um, is that Zara, because of that attachment to her faith, has that kind of conflict of interest. She's obviously in the workplace, you know, she's getting invited to um, socials at the pub, or, you know, that there's kind of that different um, environments that she's navigating um now how much of that you know was i guess you maybe your own experience and and, and again why was it important for you to um to talk about that in in your book yeah so with the thing with zara so she, zara doesn't wear hijab right mm. and i think there and um, there's this misconception about women who aren't mm. in, in hijab that they're automatically mm. more disconnected to their faith Mm. than women in hijab which is completely like not true at all yeah. um yeah. you can have people who are far far more practicing um mm. you know than people in hijab you know you just don't know what's in somebody's heart and you just don't you can't mm. tell hijab yeah. is one way of visibly looking like a muslim and obviously it's a commandment from allah um mm. but just because somebody wears it or doesn't wear it doesn't mean that they're more or less religious right so with mm. zara because she doesn't wear hijab there's this assumption that yeah she what's wrong with her dating or mm or hugging mm-hmm. men or, or going to the pub like what is the issue but i kind of wanted to highlight that not everybody is comfortable with that and mm-hmm. as a muslim woman working um in a non-muslim predominantly non-muslim environment it can be really difficult when you're when every social thing is mm-hmm. revolves around alcohol and you're yeah. not comfortable with that and automatically you're mm-hmm. alienated but i also wanted to show through that that it's not even just non-muslim people who don't get it you can get muslims who are very secular Mm. and then they question you as well and they make you feel bad and then you think hang on a second you're supposed to be on my side but you're making me feel even worse about it and it's happened to me it's happened to me with female friends you know Mm. i've got a female Mm. friend um Mm. who was like yeah let's go out for dinner and then we could this is really nice bar we can go to and she's a muslim bengali woman and i'm like yeah why would you say that (laughs) And I said, you know what, I don't go to bars. I just said, I don't go to bars. And then she gave me a hard time. She's like, what, I'm not saying we're going to be drinking. And I was like, oh, my God, are you serious? Am I having to explain myself to you? You're a Muslim and Bengali. Yeah. 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 And I'm having to explain myself to you. I've got no hope then. If I can't, I I have to explain myself to you. Then what about me and the rest of the world? You know, you're supposed to be on my team. We're not friends anymore, by the way. (laughs) You need to be friends with people on a level, you know? (laughs) Yeah. 
it's too much for me right. like the constant you know criticism yeah. of the way I choose to live my life when I, yeah. I thought it was on my side yeah, yeah, yeah I think as a Muslim there's just so much that you have to navigate anyway so the people yeah. you give to you like you need yeah. them to be on your team yeah, yeah absolutely yeah. TMI yeah. <laughs> exactly I'm thinking because even the conversations that Zara has in in finding Miss Perfectly Fine it's just like it's so palpable. I was reading and thinking, oh my God, I know how horrendous that can feel. Or, it feels you know, horrible, cool. yeah. Yeah, it really, really is. And you're right. I think if it's done by um, a fellow Muslim, <laughs> it's like, oh my word. So, yeah, but I think it's it's interesting though, isn't it? And I guess that's another thing that actually, especially maybe slightly um, kind of younger readers who, who, who maybe are single and, and going through that kind of... Um, they're building their career in, in that kind of environment and and i think maybe that is one thing that this book does do i mean it does lots of things for that for that in particular it just makes you feel a bit seen and i think i know we talk a lot about you know representation and and, and that can be a very loaded word but but that's kind of the the magic i think when it when it comes to when you are able to read your stories in, in something and it just, that's I don't know, me. That's why, yeah that's why i wanted yeah. to write one of the reasons yeah. because yeah. i wanted to read books that had people like me in it yeah. So like I, I've obviously like um, as a writer, I've read so much. I was such a book girl when I was younger. I yeah. actually used to bunk school and go to the library. Like who does? Oh. <laughs> no, I don't believe that for a second. I did whole of year <laughs> nine. Whole of year nine, That's I was so, in it was the library I love that. reading books. Yeah, yeah because yeah. I'd rather do that. You said it was the library. That. Sorry, no, no, Hornsey, Hornsey. Oh, library. Hornsey, sorry, I thought. So I it's that's in North London, London. yeah, so that was oh, down okay. the road from my school, which was Hornsey Girls School, right? And I was good in the library and read. Yeah, 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 and, yeah. Um, yeah, so basically, like, I never found a character that looked like me, and yeah. there's only so much you can relate to these characters, like, especially as a teenager, you know, what was I reading? Sweet Valley High, Babysitter's Club, Point Horror, all of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No one looked like me, no one could relate to my issues, you know? Mm -hmm. And I remember the first time I read a book that was a bit like me, was a book mm. called Born Confused and um, right. and basically it's about an Indian girl in New York and mm. now I find it so sad that the closest I got to a book that was like me was an Indian Hindu from New yeah. York yeah you know and that was the closest I got and I felt so seen just because she was brown yeah yeah yeah, yeah, so yeah. I think it's really really important yeah. that people can read literature and find mm. characters that, that look yeah. like them. I mean it does make you feel seen and it makes you feel empowered and it makes you feel heard and it gives you confidence that's right and also I think the inspiration I mean I, it's that thing of you know the more people we get into the arts and writing and, and the more stories we all have and I know obviously publishing is, is real a bit of um I have to put it gently <laughs> I don't know it's or struggle what's that <laughs> I said why publishing is very yeah. white. Is yes. oh, no, for sure, for sure. which is part of the well not part of the problem is the problem isn't it so yeah having to navigate that but you know inshallah you know the more I guess writers that you can inspire as well and, and kind of to get into the industry would be would be amazing sure. um so maybe moving on um to kind of the next question I wanted to ask it was um Zara's um mum and, and her character and um of what course, did you think of Zara's mum do you know, yeah. <laughs> I kind of liked her because it was, I think you, you encapsulated lots of moms I know, but you know what, I have to mention this because, okay, I was reading your book and the bit, I don't want to spoil it, I won't spoil it, so I won't mention the specifics, but the bit about um, the parents making Zara an email address yeah, um, yeah and the, the one they pick yeah. i was sitting on the sofa and my, my children were you know, doing whatever they were doing and i was in fits of laughter to the point <laughs> i was kind of and this one i'd gone mad i think they probably thought that he got to me but um <laughs> yeah so i thought you know she, as a mum, she's being proactive and i think she kind of had to thought was best interest at, at heart but but i think what i really liked is and, and that was kind of one of the quotes that i wanted to share um so you say um, well, you, uh, that Zara's mum is being the worst of both worlds. So tech, um, techni oh, I think tech, savvy. tech savvy and cynical like a Western mum, but still clinging on to old traditions like the village mum she claims she isn't. And I thought that was fantastic. I think you managed to um, explain kind of two sides of the coin when it came to um, the character. But the question was really that, do you think that, even though some of obviously parents might, might be like that, that the younger generation is now um, kind of challenging that? Or do you think that 
it's kind of even perpetuated because I, I have to admit sometimes I have conversations with younger mums or, or mums um, in my generation and I just think things aren't changing that much you think sometimes yes, I feel like in my circle it seems to be yeah. changing okay. well, obviously our kids are still little so mine are six and eight yeah. and yeah. our kids are still little I think by the time our kids are older mm. I think um, I'm hoping things yeah. would change to an extent because I think it'd be a shame if we lost all the beauty of our culture yeah. and there are so many beautiful things about our culture that I absolutely love and I respect mm -hmm. and I cherish yeah. and I think I think the sad thing is that's dying yeah. out with the stuff that we could let go of yeah. and I think what's the challenge what the challenge is going to be is holding on to yeah. the good parts and letting mm -hmm. go of the bad rather than letting go of the whole lot yeah. Yeah, 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 and I think that's what I'm worried about because there's so much beauty in our culture. For example, just yeah. the way we are with our families, I think it's a beautiful yeah. thing the respect yeah. that we have in the families, the way we yeah. prioritize our families and our community, yeah. the way everyone helps each other. These are amazing things of our culture that I don't want to let go of. Yeah, and I can see that dying out as well as everything else, yeah. you know. And I think for me, I think that is the biggest worry. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I think that there definitely is that kind of dilution, I guess, because obviously yeah. we being kind of the next generation and our children even more so and, and how do they identify with, with their with their culture, with their faith and, and obviously their you know, our children's I guess challenges will never be the same as ours, which obviously never as the same as our parents who obviously, you know, have to leave their homeland and, and kind of create a new life and there's so much, you know, I think that that is an yeah, within that, but no, I definitely 100% agree. It really is about kind of pe um, preserving the good. and Because and, exactly. and kind of yeah, I think the language is one thing that's dying out mm. already. Yeah. And especially in my generation, those of us who have mixed marriages, yeah. um, who are married to people from other cultures, um, mm. yeah, the language has already gone. Yeah. And um, like my kids don't speak Bengali, they know one or two yeah. words and that's it. Mm. And that's because my parents speak English. And right. obviously at home we speak English because that's how we communicate with each other. Yeah. Um, and yeah. yeah, they don't, they don't speak at yeah. all. It's really, really sad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, I agree. And I mean, like myself, and I mean, I can speak, I can speak Urdu because obviously my mum was very strict at home. So even though she could speak English, she was like, no, we are going to speak Urdu at home. <laughs> Nothing else is very strict. <laughs> but, yeah. And then I, I tried it with my children, but I realised after years and years of just conversing in, in English, it became easier. So even though I speak fluently, yeah, I mean, my child, children, they can kind of understand it, but... How old are your kids? Mine, so I have two girls who are 12 and 10. Okay. And, um, but again, the eldest knows a bit more, my youngest even kind of less so. And, but, you know, I, I kind of do want to give them that. I want them to give them an opportunity to learn it because, again, it's that access to cultural heritage and sometimes that they, they might cause a disconnect. And, but yeah, I think, you know, if there's ways that we can do that, then definitely that's really, really kind of key. Um, so I think that the, one of the, so we've got maybe a couple of, um, I think we've got about five minutes left. And there was an important point that I just wanted to bring up. So at one point in your book, so Finding Mr. Perfectly Fine, um, the main characters are, we learn about a past relationship she's had, um, which is kind of causing, obviously it was a bit traumatic and, and it's kind of, um, I guess, playing on her mind when she's talking to new people and, and trying to look for a partner. And I think it was in that moment I, I wanted to really, you know, wanted to ask that why you felt it was kind of necessary to obviously put that in there and, and again, almost interrogate the way some men behave, I think, when it when it comes to, you know, we mentioned a little bit when it, about how they can be on, on apps and things, but but yeah, so. I think I can, I guess I kind of wanted, there's a few things. So I wanted to explore like the fact that even when you're set up with somebody through family, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And your parents have like uh, agreed for this and not just agreed, they've introduced you to somebody mm -hmm. that even then you're not as a woman in this society, yeah. we're not necessarily safeguarded just because our family know each other. Yeah. And I think that's something that isn't really talked about. And I, I don't know how often it happens because no one yeah. talks about it. But I have heard of cases where this kind of thing has happened. Mm -hmm. And because families know that, and they're getting married, guys think that they can do whatever they want. Mm -hmm. And I think the fact that there's a lot of silence in our community gives empowers them as well to do what they want because they know you're never going to talk about it right yeah, 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 um, exactly. not unless you want to ruin the chances of getting married forever and yeah, i think yeah. that's one thing i wanted to explore and i also wanted to explore the trauma that that can hold so that has basically um changed the way she deals with everybody and the way she lives her life because of what she went mm -hmm. through 
Um, yeah. So I wanted to look at that as well. And I wanted to kind of just touch upon, because like I said, I look at deep topics, but I just do it lightly. And yeah. I just wanted to touch upon the fact that silence in our community and how important it is not to be silent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is to to speak up when anything happens that isn't right. That you yeah. know we should we need to be empowered enough to speak up mm. so that it doesn't happen again. And so you can also move on and you can heal yeah. because until she speaks about it, she doesn't. She can't heal herself. Yeah, yeah that's right. Yeah, and I think it's um, again, you know, I think you're right. You you kind of don't maybe go too deeply, but it's enough to start the conversation and get people, yeah. I think, thinking. And um, I mean, I would definitely recommend. So, you know, um, for any of our listeners, so we're talking to Tasneem Abdul Rashid um, on her debut book, Finding Mr. Perfectly Fine. Um, but if you have a book club or a reading group, you know, it's got other than the fact that it's really um, a great book. But in terms of the conversations that you could potentially have in you know with friends and family i think is you know is brilliant and, and i think kind of on that note because we've got a couple of minutes left like do you have anything else in, in the pipeline that we can um yeah, yeah. So, uh, so i'm writing something else at the moment so right. the book deal that i got with zappa was for a two book deal mm. so it's this and another book which is standalone it's not a sequel sure. um it's a standalone book so i started writing it. it's also based from like the mm -hmm. main characters Bengali, also from north london but it's a very very different story it's a romance as well kind of yeah. um yeah so that's i'm working on that at the moment and i've also actually written a teenage book Mm, I've a teenage really? book, so I'm mm. looking to getting that published, inshallah, soon. Uh, not soon, because publishing is really slow. It's never soon. Yeah, well, <laughs> point, yeah. I should say um, yeah. that out there. And I think the the teenage one definitely is something yeah. that I've wanted to write my whole life. Yeah. And it's the book I wish I had when I was a teenager. So I'm really, yeah. really excited about that as well. That's but inshallah, brilliant. it's the yeah. first of me. Like I hope this is the beginning and not the end. No. Um, no. Really, no. I mean, may Allah, you know, give you more success. I think you know it's such a, a beautiful book, and and um, I will definitely carry it. You know, in terms of things that I've taken from it, you know, with me, and and I'm looking forward to my girls getting old. I'll be like, yes, <laughs> let's read this together, and I'll, do, I'll probably do something like that. But um, and just lastly, where can people follow you or your work? It'd be great, you know, if they wanted to. Yeah, um, yeah. so I'm most active on Instagram. Um, mm -hmm. so you can follow me at Tasneem A Rashid. Mm -hmm. um, but if you just search my name, Tessie Maldorishi on Instagram, that will come up. And I basically talk a lot about my writing journey on that. I've had book reviews mm -hmm. stuff about my book. Um, yeah. yeah, so inshallah, you can follow me there. Fantastic. And I did want to mention, actually, I'm just going to do a shout out to my mum because my mum's name is also the Sneem. Oh, um, so, amazing. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm always good, right? To, to see a name that you know. In, yeah, in no, course, right? honestly, beautiful. I can't even explain to you. But um, but thank you so much, Sneem, for, for your Thank time you for having me. This is my first book club talk about the book. Oh, yeah, no, first so radio about the book. So, you know, this has been amazing. Thank you so much for having me and for reading it quick enough. Like, it's only been a week or so. No, so. I know. I, I definitely <laughs> Thank, thank you so, so much, much. thank and, you uh, and yes uh listeners so we will i'll be back and hopefully inshallah next week thank you for listening to our podcast why not tune in to our live stream at inspirefm.org and follow and subscribe to our social media platforms at inspirefm luton